I'm Jamie S. Rich, and this is Back to the Gutter. I like to use these Pentel pocket brushes. Yeah, it's a beautiful pocket. I use a Winsor Newton Series 7. I love comics, so I Hello, and today we are in the studio of Ibrahim Mustafa, who you might know as the artist for the Eisner-nominated series High Crimes, written by Christopher Sabella. How's it going today? Ibrahim? Good, man. How you doing? Pretty good. I'm, I'm actually really kind of curious to talk to you because, as I was saying before we came on, like you're kind of a mystery so far. You're a new, a new property. Where the hell did no. you come from? <laughs> uh, I, was, uh, I was kind of toiling away behind the scenes trying to get to a point where I could, you know, feel good enough about my work to, to sort of put it out there. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I got into comics kind of late. I read them as a kid and was into, you know, superheroes and, and the cartoons and all that. And then it wasn't until like my late teens that I, I really started like going to the shop and buying them again. And I'd been drawing, you know, since I could hold a pencil pretty much. So eventually those two interests converged again and I, I really realized that I kind of wanted to pursue it as a career, so. Yeah, because I met you, I think, three or so years ago at a stump town, mm -hmm. and you came up and introduced yourself, and you handed me this miniature portfolio that I was able to take home, and it's to this day, it's still the most impressive sort of introductory package I've ever well, thank seen. thank you. Because one, you were <laughs> awesome already then, and two, it was just like, oh, I remember this guy. I remember someone who gave me this cool little book that I could take home, and, and you, so you really stood out. Uh, were you working on anything then at that point, or were you just sort of walking around? I was. Uh, I did a a four issue mini series through IDW. The pound. The pound. Yeah, it was the second volume, uh, and I somebody else had drawn the first arc. A guy named Carl Weller, and uh, so at that time, uh, the pound was getting close to wrapping, and I was trying to line something else up. So, pretty much, yeah, I printed up a bunch of those little portfolios and sort of a hail mary, just tried to drop it on as many people as I could to kind of get my work out there and meet different writers and uh, with that show specifically I, I kind of realized at that point that there are sort of two avenues in comics nowadays like you can either stand in line uh, in portfolio review lines at conventions and and you know person A says oh I like what you're doing here don't like that there and then the next person says I really don't like this here but that there is great and you're like well but I so <laughs> uh, then the other avenue seemed to be do creator own stuff, right. more independent work, and then you kind of start to get noticed and are able to move up through the ranks. So that's really the the avenue that I've been trying to pursue. And is that how you hooked up with Sabella, or? Uh, yeah, well, you know, I I had joined up uh, the Tranquility Bay Studio here in Portland uh, through Brandon Seifert, who had become a friend of mine, and they had an opening, and he invited me to come meet everybody and see if I wanted to join up. Uh, and I did, and uh, Joe Keating was a member there, um, and he knows you know everybody in comics pretty much. And uh, I told him that I was looking to do some creator own stuff, and if he knew anyone who was looking for an artist, you know, drop me a line. And uh, he asked what I wanted to do, and I told him that crime was the genre that I was most interested in. And then about like two weeks later, he brought Chris Sabella by the studio and was like, "I think you guys should talk." So what? Give people like the basic then pitch of High Crimes. Like, what was the concept that that nailed it for you? Uh, High Crimes is about a disgraced uh, Olympic snowboarder named Suzanne Jensen. Uh, drug problems. She lost her endorsements, uh, and so she ends up in Kathmandu, where sort of nobody knows who she is, and she can kind of move about in anonymity. And uh, mountain climbing was kind of the only other thing she ever liked to do. So she ends up as a climbing guide in the Himalayas, and she works with an older partner. And the two of them have uh, kind of a side racket where when they find uh, a dead body up on the mountain, they strip the personal effects and they cut off one of the hands. Uh, and then they uh, extort the family members for a finder's fee through locating them through the fingerprints from the hand. Uh, one of the bodies they find happens to be that of an ex-government operative who's you know, kind of wet works agent. And uh, when they scan his prints, his old handlers start looking for him and hits the fan. Because you guys became basically one of the first breakout hits for digital comics. Not web comics, but like strictly digital because Monkey Brain publishes through Comixology. Were you, were you prepared for that kind of reaction? Did you have any idea like what kind of format you were, what, how that format was going to be received when you walked into it? Or? You know, uh, not really. At that time, digital was, you know, people were definitely reading comics on their iPads and stuff. So... 
So I knew that it was going to be a platform that was received enough to where people would read it. And uh, Chris's script was just so good. Like I was, I had a lot of faith in what he was doing and then what what we were doing together. So the hope was just kind of that it was going to get to enough eyes to actually have people check it out. Um, and it was it was amazing. Like the the response we got from it. How much time do you have to put in for research? Because you're penciling, inking, and coloring the mm -hmm. whole thing. It's set in a far off locale. It's got lots of tech to it. It seems like you're taking on quite a large task for for a newbie. The research is a huge part of it. Um, I've never been to Kathmandu or anywhere in Nepal, and neither has Chris. So a lot of it's been like documentaries, YouTube videos have been a major help because people, you know, with GoPros nowadays, right. they'll they'll film their ascent from Camp Two to Camp Three and that sort of thing. So, um, but yeah, Kathmandu, especially in the first couple issues. It's a very dense city and there's a lot of signage and wires and cables going from building to building and um, you know so there was definitely a lot of Google image searches. You said you were drawn to doing crime comics. What were the comics then though that, that got you into wanting to be in this business because most folks are like I want to do superheroes and we are surrounded by lots of Superman yeah. drawings. And <laughs> uh, you know Superman is definitely still the goal um, and I got very close to it but then Adventures of Superman was cancelled. So, oh, okay. <laughs> but I got to do some tryout pages and ended up getting some other work through DC through the same editor. But uh, um, yeah, Superman was just kind of always the thing for me. And um, I, it's funny, I, I was really into the movies as a kid uh, and then kind of fell out of that whole thing for a long time. And then when Smallville came on the air, that kind of reignited my interest in, in the character. And then eventually uh, somebody got me a, a, a book that was like the complete history of Superman and it had Alex Ross paintings in it, which I had never seen before. And I was always more drawn towards realism. So when I saw his work, I was like, you can do that, you know? And then that just kind of led me down the rabbit hole. Like I ended up getting Kingdom Come and then I started following Mark Wade's work and then, you know, different, different books by different people. And then you start to kind of follow their work. And I was, uh, I was really drawn to Michael Lark's stuff on Daredevil. Uh, and then I started following Brubaker, which led me to Criminal. And then I really started to realize like this genre in comics is just right. fantastic. So what was it then that brought your family down here from Seattle? Was it a change or in job or? Uh, my, yeah, my dad got a, a job in Walla Walla, Washington actually. So we were there for about a year or two and then we moved to Clackamas. Uh, and then when I was nine, my parents split. And then uh, my parents, you know, because they split, my dad didn't really stick around. He ended up back in Egypt. So uh, without, you know, the financial support from his side of things, uh, my mom was, you know, working, going back to school. So a lot of creative endeavors for me came out of kind of necessity. Like, you know, you can't really afford toys, so like you make your own thing or, you know, you find different ways to kind of occupy, occupy yourself. So um, drawing was kind of a big thing for me as far as that went. Um, and you know, it was just like a easily affordable way to, to kind of do whatever you wanted. So, were you on another track before comics? Were you looking to do some other kind of art, or were you going to go in even a different sort of field? Uh, there was a while where I was flirting with uh, dancing. I, I grew up. Uh, I started break dancing when I was like 15, or doing like poppin and the robot and that kind of stuff. And I taught classes for a long time, uh, which can be a, a good gig, but it's you know a lot of floating around to different places, and you know it's a it's a lot of like self-promotion, which I guess comics is too, but uh, it felt like one of those things that would be a lot harder to kind of <laughs> make up. Yeah, I wish I'd brought a cardboard box we could put in. <laughs> I think we were talking earlier, you did art college for a while or? Uh, for a while, actually, I wanted to be an art teacher because I figured that was sort of the tangible job you could get as an artist where you weren't going to live hand to mouth as much, at least. <laughs> um, and then... Uh, I sort of became disillusioned with school and the whole process of that. I got into community college and got an associate's degree and then I, I was going to transfer to Portland State and I realized you know, I have to take all these ancillary classes that don't pertain to your major and I really just wanted to do comics so I took a year off from school and started kind of writing and drawing my own self-published thing that I did an issue of and I learned how to color, uh, I taught myself Photoshop and all that. Um, and then just really kept at it and uh, a, a really pivotal moment was uh, getting a portfolio review from uh, Bob Shrek who was you know past guest on the show um, he really changed the way I looked at comic art um, I remember I had drawn a barn in this particular panel 
and I had used a ruler and I was so proud of it with my microns. It was like super clean lines and, and Bob looked at it and he said, look, I know this is a barn, but I'm not going to step in any horse shit in this barn. It's too pretty, you know, it's too clean. And then he explained to me how you got to get a brush and really get the wood, yeah. you know. So then uh, he sent me to Steve Lieber, who showed me some cool stuff. And then he sent me to Jonathan Case, who showed me some cool stuff. And then uh, I had already had this kind of a background in watercolor, so I was comfortable with brush stuff. And then I just, you know, kept going at it. And then eventually, you know, kind of tried to keep honing things until I, I found a style I was happier with. And, and uh, what's next then? Like, what's your plan of attack for following up high crimes? Do you have one or are you just rolling with it? Uh, you know, a few irons in the fire. Um, not really sure just yet. Uh, I I got a I started working uh, a day job in animation recently, um, so you know that's a kind of a full time gig. So I'm I'm hoping that that will allow me to kind of uh, be selective and pick something that I really just right. love. You know, would want to draw and and not something that's like going to pay the bills. Yeah, like where I guess the question more is, and where do you hope? you would you, where do you see yourself ending up like what's what's the mountaintop for you i would i would love to keep doing creator own stuff um you know experiment with illustration styles a little bit and uh and you know just try to do something independent that that people dig um and of course i really want to draw superman so <laughs> and, and even though the books are coming out you know, high crime's coming out digital first. Are you working traditionally or like on paper and all that stuff? Or? Yeah, yeah. Um, sometimes uh, I'll I'll lay out pages digitally, um, you know, on like a tablet screen. But uh, all my penciling and inking is still by hand. Well, I think that's the sort of thing we want to take a look at. So if we want to move over to your art table, can you show us some art? And yeah, tell me absolutely. Your, tell me your process. Let's do it. Excellent. And so now we've moved over to the drawing desk of Ibrahim so we can see a little bit about his process, how he puts a page together, and what tools he works with. So it looks like you're working on High Crimes actually today. I am. This is, uh, I believe, page five of issue 10. Um, so this one I just penciled recently. Um, and then here's the, uh, the script for it. Uh, and from this stage, I'll, I'll print out Chris's script. Uh, sometimes I'll, I'll doodle uh, the different panel ideas I have in the margins. Uh, other times I do it on a, uh, a loose leaf sheet like this. Um, and then sometimes I'll do it digitally too. I have a separate studio where I have a, uh, like a touch screen monitor mm -hmm. that I draw onto. And then from there I will arrange uh, all the panels in Photoshop to the sizes and the, the layout that I want. And I always try to play with the panel layout quite a bit because I want the you know, I try to avoid doing just kind of a standard grid as much as possible because I like it to be dynamic right. and create one panel to kind of be the focus and the important one. So I guess walk us through a little bit here. You're talking about you, you don't like to have the standard grid. You like to have you shake up the panels a little bit. Well, I guess walk us maybe through some of your thinking here. Yeah. Um, so this uh, this first panel here, um, I have as kind of an inset. And then the second panel, we have our main character, Zan, looking into this crevasse that she's about to drop a body into. Uh, so uh, I thought, you know, a cool way to look at this would be looking up at her rather than over her shoulder or like a, a you know, profile shot. Uh, so you kind of see where that body's heading to. Um, and then this is going to be all black, which is indicated by these little X's here. Um, so. The, the black in this will sort of frame the whole page, uh, and then these other panels will be set inside of that, uh, and then this this bottom panel will will uh, most likely fade it out into you know from the black here into something a little lighter as I go down, and then you know I approach inking the same way as far as uh, you know trying to start with something that is actually going to be fun, uh, or or the least fun rather, so that I'm not uh, front loading with all the good stuff. Um, but then from there I'll take a, a you know, kind of standard industry watercolor brush with a nice fine tip on it and then I'll just kind of go in and uh, do a lot of the outlining stuff first. Um, typically I'll draw the panel borders in with ink first but that's my least favorite part so I try right. to get it done. Uh, but sometimes I save it for last. Um, with this book I get to draw a lot of big puffy 
coats and sleeping bags and tents and uh, backpacks. So. <laughs> And are you exclusively brush, or do you mix it up? Or I'll uh, I'll use a couple different things. Um, you know, I use kind of like fine tip micron pens a lot. Uh, I have these uh, Japanese brush pens that get kind of a similar look to a, a brush, but uh, you have a lot more control over it, um, and you can kind of go thick to thin, varying pressure. Um, depending, you know, I, I've tried to set myself up to where I can draw anywhere. Um, so I take this stuff with me, like, you know, the, the thing about indie comics, especially if you're working other stuff on the side, is you kind of have to find the time to do it, otherwise it's not going to happen. So I have kind of a mobile setup, and that's why I'm able to go between my home studio and my work studio. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, the brush and, the, you know, dipping it in the ink can be kind of, not only something you can set up at, like, your mom's dinner table right. or, or Starbucks. So I have one of these uh, uh, brush pens that Pentel makes. Um, and these you can get at any art supply store. Uh, they, they can approximate kind of a regular brush pretty well. Um, you don't have as much control because the bristles aren't as rigid. Uh, there's kind of a synthetic thing that uh, is a little bit softer, but I've sort of been using it long enough now that I can kind of uh, jump between the two with, without too many varying degrees of difference. So can you walk us through some of your tools and show us kind of, I mean, people love to see like what artists use. Can you show us your pencils, your brushes, that kind of thing? Yeah. Um, so for uh, inking, a lot of people will use a Winsor & Newton uh, Series 7 Sable brush, which is Winsor & Newton is probably the predominant watercolor yeah. uh, brand out there. Um, the nice thing about those brushes is that they have a really fine tip, uh, so you can get like really, really thin lines with them, uh, but you can get fat ones too, and you know, just varying pressure. Um, so this is a, uh, a Dick Blick brand one, which is much less expensive, but pretty much gets the exact same results. So, <laughs> um, so I use that for the bulk of my inking, and then I'll have like larger, just kind of inexpensive, uh, you know, round brushes that I'll use for like larger areas. Like this is a brush uh, a size six that I would use for these dark areas, uh, or even like a 12 maybe, which is much bigger than that. And is that a cover design yeah, in there? Yeah, this one is actually the cover of uh, issue eight. And that was the first concept I did, and then this is what it ended up being in the long run. Oh, nice. Um, so in the series, uh, the climbers will remove the hands of the dead climbers that they find. So I, I wanted to find some kind of cool way to have a hand in the negative space. So we've got our uh, main character's Olympic medals that she's carried with her throughout the series falling into this crevasse. And then within the negative space, it creates the hand. And then I have a red ax uh, to kind of signify where the, the hand gets cut off. Um, with covers, I try to do like a, a lot of cool colors and then something warm in the middle to kind of pull your eye towards it. Um, this one here was a cover to number five. Uh, so in the in the background we have Everest, uh, and there was kind of some mist and fog, and then uh, some of these rock formations that, that people build. And then these are the Tibetan prayer flags, and then uh, one of the main characters is missing a hand, and this is the bandage, so it was kind of bloodied, and so there's a little splash of color in the middle, and then the kind of... So even though you're working for people to see this either as a thumbnail when they're buying it on Comixology or on their iPad, you're still kind of thinking along the lines of if this were cover in a comic book shop. Absolutely. Um, covers are just fun for me. That's, you know, you get to kind of stretch your design muscles a little bit more. Uh, but also, um, the, uh, the thing about the digital storefront is that you know, your, your cover is going to be with a bunch of other covers and right. it's going to be super tiny. It's like, you know, a little bigger than a postage stamp maybe, depending on the device you're looking at it. So the simpler it is and, and the, the more stark it is, the easier it is to draw the viewer's eye in. So that's something I always keep in mind too. How, how is this going to look good, small versus large on your screen? Well, it was really cool to see how you put all this stuff together. So thanks for inviting us into your studio. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you. So as we heard in the interview, Ibrahim is a break dancer, not just a break dancer, but a championship break dancer. And he's got the trophy here to prove it. And he's going to show me some moves today.
All right, so the, the type of dancing that I do specifically is called funk styles, and it, it falls within the hip-hop family. Um, and it came out of the funk movement in the West Coast. So poppin' is one of them, which is a lot of kind of just muscle control. And there's waving. And the robot, which is my favorite. We could paint you silver and take you out and make some money. I've done it. I haven't done the paint thing, but I've, I've definitely busked a little bit. All right. Uh, and then uh, from there, there's styles like Boogaloo, which is kind of like a rolly. There's one called Tutting, which I should be exceptional at, but I'm not really. That either. seems like that would be in your blood. <laughs> He's, you said it, not me. Right. Oh, no. yeah. Stand on my ground in the tussle when it's wiser to run over You put your soul into it. All right.